Welcome. This is the one year Bible reading for October 20th, and we're starting in the 35th chapter of the book of Jeremiah this morning. This is the message the Lord gave Jeremiah when Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, was the king of Judah. Go to the settlement where the families of the Rechabites live and invite them to the Lord's temple. Take them into the one of the inner rooms and offer them some wine. So I went to see Jeazaniah, uh, son of Jeremiah, and grandson of Habazaniah, and all of his brothers and sons, representing all the Rechabite families. I took them to the temple, and we went into the room assigned to the sons of Hanan, son of Igdaliah, a man of God. This room was located next to the one used by the palace officials, directly above the room of Messiah, son of Shalom, the temple gatekeeper. I set cups and jugs of wine before them and invited them to have a drink, but they refused. No, they said, we don't drink wine, because Jehonadab, son of Rechab, our ancestor, gave us this command. You and your descendants must never drink wine. And do not build houses or plant crops or vineyards, but always live in tents. If you follow these commands, you will live long, good lives in the land. So we have obeyed him in all these things. We have never had a drink of wine since then, nor have our wives, our sons, or our daughters. We haven't built houses or owned vineyards or farms or planted crops. We have lived in tents and have fully obeyed all the commands of Jehonadab, our ancestor. Now, this I read in a commentary was about 200 years that they have done this, so throughout multiple generations. But when King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon arrived in this country, we were afraid of the Babylonian and Aramean armies, so we decided to move to Jerusalem. That is why we are here. Then the Lord gave this message to Jeremiah. The Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says, Go and say to the people in Judah and Jerusalem, Come and learn a lesson about how to obey me. The Rechabites do not drink wine because their ancestor, Jehonadab, told them not to. But I have spoken to you again and again, and you refuse to listen or obey. I have sent you prophet after prophet to tell you to turn from your wicked ways and to stop worshiping other gods so that you might live in peace here in the land I gave to you and your ancestors. But you would not listen or obey. The families of Rechab have enjoyed, obeyed their ancestor completely, but you have refused to listen to me. Therefore, the Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel says, because you refuse to listen or answer when I call, I will send upon Judah and Jerusalem all the disasters I have threatened. Then Jeremiah turned to the Rechabites and said, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. You have obeyed your ancestor, Jehonadab, in every respect, following all of his instructions. Because of this, Jehonadab, son of Rechab, will always have descendants who serve me. I, the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, have spoken. During the fourth year that King Jehoiakim, son of Judah, was king in Judah, the Lord gave this message to Jeremiah. Get a scroll and write down all my messages against Israel, Judah, and the other nations. Begin with the first message back in the days of Josiah and write down every message you have given right up to the present time. Perhaps the people of Judah will repent if they see in writing all the terrible things I have planned for them. Then I will be able to forgive their sins and wrongdoings. So Jer Jeremiah sent for Baruch, son of Neriah, as, and as Jeremiah directed, dictated, uh, Baruch wrote down all the prophecies that the Lord had given him. Then Jeremiah said to Baruch, I am a prisoner here and unable to go to the temple. So you go to the temple on the next day of fasting and read the messages from the Lord that are on this scroll. On that day, people will be there from all over Judah. Perhaps even yet they will turn from their evil ways and ask the Lord's forgiveness before it is too late for the Lord's terrible anger has been pronounced against them. Baruch did as Jeremiah told him and read these messages from the Lord to the people at the temple. This happened on the day of sacred fasting held in late autumn during the fifth year of the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah. People from all over Judah came to attend the services in the temple that day. Baruch read Jeremiah's words to all the people from the temple room of Gemariah, son of Shaphan. 
This room was just off the upper courtyard of the temple, near the new gate entrance. When Micaiah, son of Gamariah and grandson of Shaphan, heard the messages from the Lord, he went down to the secretary's room in the palace where the administrative officials were meeting. Elishama, the secretary, was there along with Delaiah, El Nathan, son of Akbor, Gemariah, son of Shaphan, Zedekiah, son of Hananiah, and all the others with official responsibilities. When Micaiah uh, told them about the messages Baruch was reading to the people, the officials sent Jehudai, son of Nethaniah, grandson of Shelemiah, and great-grandson of Cushai, to ask to come and read the messages to them too. So Baruch told, took the scroll and went to them. Sit down and read the scroll to us, the officials said, and Baruch did as they requested. By the time Baruch had finished reading, they were badly frightened. We must tell the king what we have heard, they said, but first tell us how you got these messages. Did they come directly from Jeremiah? So Baruch explained, Jeremiah dictated to them to me word by word, and I wrote down his words with ink on this scroll. You and Jeremiah should both hide, the officials told Baruch. Don't tell anyone you are here. Then the officials left the scroll for safekeeping in the room of Elishama, the secretary, and went to tell the king. The king sent Jehudai to get the scroll. Jehudai brought it from Elishama's room and read it to the king as all of his officials stood by. It was late autumn and the king was in a winterized part of the palace, sitting in front of a fire to keep him warm. Whenever Jehudai finished reading three or four columns, the king took his knife and cut off that section of the scroll. He then threw it into the fire section by section until the whole scroll was burned up. Neither the king nor his officials showed any sign of fear or repentance at what they had heard. Even when El Nathan, Delaiah, and Gemariah begged the king not to burn the scroll, he wouldn't listen. Then the king commanded his son, Jeremiel, Sarai, uh, Sariah, son of Azrael, and Shelemiah, son of Abdeel, to arrest Baruch and Jeremiah, but the Lord had hidden them. After the king had burned Jeremiah's scroll, the Lord gave Jeremiah another message. He said, get another scroll and write everything again, just as you did on the scroll King Jehoiakim burned. Then say to the king, this is what the Lord says. You burned the scroll because it said the king of Babylon would destroy this land and everything in it. Now this is what the Lord says about King Jehoiakim of Judah. He will have no heirs to sit on the throne of David. His dead body will be thrown out to lie unburied, exposed to hot days and frosty nights. I will punish him and his family and his officials because of their sins. I will pour out on them and on all the people of Judah and Jerusalem all the disasters I have promised, for they would not listen to my warnings. Then Jeremiah took another scroll and dictated again to his secretary Baruch. He wrote everything that had been on the scroll of King Jehoiakim and had, had burned in the fire. Only this time he added much more. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Never speak harshly to an older man, but appeal to him respectfully as though he were your own father. Talk to the younger men as you would to your own brothers. Treat the older women as you would your mother and treat the younger women with all purity as your own sisters. The church should care for any widow who has no one else to care for her. But if she has children or grandchildren, their first responsibility is to show godliness at home and repay their parents by taking care of them. This is something that pleases God very much. But a woman who is a true widow, who is alone, truly alone in this world, has placed her hope in God. Night and day she asks God for help and spends much time in prayer. But the widow who lives only for pleasure is spiritually dead. Give these instructions to the church so that the widows you support will not be criticized. But those who won't care for their own relatives, especially those living in the same household, have denied what we believe. Such people are worse than unbelievers. A widow who is put on the list for support must be a woman who is at least 60 years old and was faithful to her husband. She must be well respected by everyone because of the good she has done. Has she brought up her children well? Has she been kind to strangers? 
Has she served other Christians humbly? Has she helped those who are in trouble? Has she always been ready to do good? The younger widows should not be on the list because their physical desires will overpower their devotion to Christ and they will want to remarry. Then they would be guilty of breaking their previous pledge. Besides, they are likely to become lazy and spend their time gossiping from house to house, getting into other people's business and saying things that they shouldn't. So I advise these younger widows to marry again, have children, and take care of their own homes. Then the enemy will not be able to say anything against them, for I am afraid that some of them have already gone astray and now follow Satan. If a Christian woman has relatives who are widows, she must take care of them and not put the responsibility on the church. Then the church can care for widows who are truly alone. Elders who do their work well should be paid well, especially those who work hard at both preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, do not keep an ox from eating as it treads out the grain. And in another place, those who work deserve their pay. Do not listen to complaints against an elder unless there are two or three witnesses to accuse him. Anyone who sins should be rebuked in front of the whole church so that others will have a proper fear of God. I solemnly command you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus and the holy angels to obey these instructions without taking sides or showing special favor to anyone. Never be in a hurry about appointing an elder. Do not participate in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Don't drink only water. You ought to drink a little wine for the sake of your stomach because you are sick so often. Remember that some people lead sinful lives, and everyone knows that they will be judged. But there are others whose sin will not be revealed until later. In the same way, everyone knows how much good some people do, but there are others whose good deeds won't be known until later. Psalm 89, continuing with verse 14 today. Your throne is founded on two strong pillars, righteousness and justice. Unfailing love and truth walk before you as attendants. Happy are those who hear the joyful call to worship, for they will walk in the light of your presence, Lord. They rejoice all day long in your wonderful reputation. They exult in your, holy, in your righteousness. You are their glorious strength. Our power is based on your favor. Yes, our protection comes from the Lord, and he, the Holy One of Israel, has given us our King. You once spoke in a vision to your prophet and said, I have given help to a warrior. I have selected him from the common people to be king. I have found my servant David. I have anointed him with my holy oil. I will steady him and I will make him strong. His enemies will not get the best of him, nor will the wicked overpower him. I will beat down his adversaries before him and destroy those who hate him. My faithfulness and unfailing love will be with him, and he will rise to power because of me. I will extend his rule from the Mediterranean Sea in the west to the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in the east. And he will say to me, you are my father, my God and the rock of my salvation. I will make him my firstborn son, the mightiest king on earth. I will love him and be kind to him forever. My covenant with him will never end. I will preserve an heir for him. His throne will be as endless as the days of heaven. But if his sons forsake my law and fail to walk in my ways, if they do not obey my decrees and fail to keep my commands, then I will punish their sin with the rod and their disobedience with beating. But I will never stop loving him nor let my promise to him fail. No, I will not break my covenant nor will I take back a single word I said. I have sworn an oath to David, and in my holiness I cannot lie. His dynasty will go on forever. His throne is as secure as the sun, as eternal as the moon, my faithful witness in the sky. Proverbs 25, 25 through 27. Good news from far away is like cold water to the thirsty. If the godly compromise with the wicked, It is like polluting a fountain or muddying a spring. Just as it is not good to eat too much honey, it is not good for people to think about all the honors they deserve. And to end today, I have a blessing for you that comes from 
Wonderful set of verses, Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. May the phrase, let go and let God, take on a whole new meaning for you. May you learn to rest while he works on your behalf. May you understand your role in this kingdom sto uh, kingdom story and do only what he tells you to do. May you live free from the bondage of others' opinions so you're free to love them the way Christ does. And may others be so drawn to your healed heart that they come to know Jesus for themselves. Rest in him. I hope we can all do that today. Love you all. Have a beautiful day.